Welcome to Museum Platicas, Friends of the Museum of South Texas History. My name is Francisco Hardo. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Museum. And on this December day, December the 12th of the year 2022, we wanted to become steeped in the understanding of today. Today is a historical day. Today as the day of the Virgen de Guadalupe. So what we have done is we have invited a good friend, uh, Father Sam Arispe, who will be joining me in this program for a platica today. And so really the, the bulk of the day of today's museum platica will really be having a conversation with Father Sam Arispe. So what we'd like to do is, is get to know who Father Sam is and then move into the really the substance of the day, which is really to have this dialogue about the meaning and, and the history of La Virgen de Guadalupe. So it is December the 12th. It is the day, the reported day when Juan Diego uh, purportedly saw La Virgencita. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, talk a little bit about the symbolism of the Virgen. You see La Virgencita behind me. And so there's so much about the iconography around it. And so Father Sam will help us to deconstruct all that, to help us have a sense of the history, a sense of the, the, the imagery and the colors and the purpose of this very, very important, both cultural, historical, and religious and spiritual icon for many people in this world. So when we come back, we're going to engage in that platica. So stay with us. to most history offers access to the museum free of charge, notices of upcoming programs, quarterly editions of Borderlines, and a discount on most purchases in the museum store. Give a meaningful gift this year. Happy Holidays! Welcome back to the Museum of South Texas History's Museum Platicas. I was actually like in a rush to send a, to, to post because, you know, I, I want to encourage people to be active, you know, through our Facebook Live page. And so if anybody is watching and you want to interact with us, with Father Sam or with me or with the museum, by all means, just post something. I was going to post Father Sam. I was going to post, but I ran out of time. Did you have a blog yourself? Is well, this true? You have a podcast. I have a podcast, yes. And, and so what is the nature of your podcast? What do you do through your podcast? Well, the podcast uh, is titled Abba Samuel or Abba Samuel. 
And I touch on themes of spirituality, holiness, biblical uh, passages, any issues that have to do with the practice of our faith. So, Father Sam Samuel Arispe, before we get into the conversation, I would like our audience to know who you are. Where are you from? How did you find the kind of inspiration mm. to become a Catholic priest? What's that story like? Mm -hmm. Well, I think every priest would say, from the Pope on down, I think uh, every priest would say, the inspiration found me. I didn't go looking for the inspiration. And of course, the fountain of all inspiration is the Holy Spirit. So I'd have to say, well, the Holy Spirit, uh, I looked and looked and looked until uh, um, I said yes. I tried uh, avoiding uh, responding to the call, much like Juan Diego. Uh, but I was born in Houston, April 25, 1953. Lived there for about the first five years of my life. My mother remarried and my stepfather moved us to a little town, Ganeiro or Ganado, 90 miles southwest of Houston on Highway 59. I went to public school there, and then my seventh and eighth grade uh, of elementary were in Catholic school. And it was while I was in Catholic school, uh, attending mass uh, regularly, that I began to feel a love for the Holy Eucharist, the sacrifice of the mass. Uh, and then when I was 15, 1968, I went away to what uh, the church called high school seminaries. Back in this, up until the 60s, uh, the U.S. had uh, high school seminaries for high school aged uh, boys to go and discern their call to the priesthood. And so that was my first entry into study for the priesthood, discerning whether I desired priesthood. And of course, I was quite young, so it took me many more years to really discern that call in the meantime, I went on to become a missionary brother of charity, uh, a group, uh, a religious uh, community founded by Mother Teresa. I thought I would be doing that line of work for the rest of my life. But as I said, the Lord didn't give up on me and he kept calling and calling. I kept falling more and more in love with the holy sacrifice of the mass and when you fall in love, you can't ignore that love. And so I looked around, I left the, the, uh, I left the Missionary Brothers of Charity, I looked around for a diocese, and eventually was led down to this diocese because I wanted to minister in a predominantly Hispanic, Spanish-speaking Spanish diocese. And uh, the vocation director in Galveston, Houston said, hey, I know someone down in the Diocese of Brownsville. His name is uh, Monsignor Gustavo Barrera. And so I contacted him. Lo and behold, he and I had known each other from that time that I was in high school seminary. He was in college seminary and he remembered me, I remembered him. He interviewed me and he and Bishop John Joseph Fitzpatrick accepted me into the diocese. So that in a nutshell is... is what, what year was that when you... First came down? First came to this diocese. 1982. Hmm. Yeah. 1982. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. So you may be getting close to retirement age. Oh, yes. Does that happen for priests, Father Oh, yes, yes, yes. I am 69, uh, going on 70, April 25, 1953. I'm registered at Walmart. <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking of retiring within a year and a half or two. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But of course, once a priest, always a priest. So you don't, you don't step away from your priesthood because of the nature of priesthood. Uh, I am what's called a diocesan priest, so I was ordained to minister specifically for this diocese of Brownsville, which comprises the four counties uh, of, of, uh, of this, this part of Texas. So when I retire, I have an option. I have the choice of staying here or 
retiring and going to live with my family or elsewhere. But I love it here, so I think mm. I'm going to stay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, does a priest have to be registered at Walmart? Like, could you be registered <laughs> at Dillard's or somewhere? <laughs> I tell the people that because they get a kick out of it. And, and, um, and the people are always very generous. They're always showing their, their uh, appreciation of us. I think I met you through um, through the INLEs many years ago mm -hmm. because you loved to frequent INLEs restaurant on North Tenth on yeah. North Tenth, yeah. and the chef there was John Ionelli, yeah. who is a maybe a devout Catholic. Uh, and jo Johnny used to come from the kitchen to say hello to you whenever yes. you used to go to yeah. INLEs, yeah. and at one point about thirty years ago. Johnny and Yvette, who are you know in, part of my family, Yvette is my sister-in-law, said, "You got to come meet this priest, Father Sam." And so I think Yvonne and I met you about thirty years ago, yes. and then we followed you. We used to go to your masses, and both in in San Carlos, when you were at St. Joseph's the Worker, we would go there on Sundays, yeah. and then when you were in Faysville. We used to go to your masses as well. That's right. Because you were... And I was also pastor at San Manuel. St. Anne's Manuel. in San Manuel. Yeah. Well, when you're, when you're with that church, you have to make all that round, don't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. Yes. It's, okay. it's uh, uh, The Diocese of Brownsville has two distinctions. It's known for these two distinctions. For these, two. It is the most Catholic, per capita, it is the most Catholic diocese in the whole United States. We're about 86, 87 uh, percent of the population is Catholic, but we also have the greatest shortage of priests of all the dioceses in the U.S. So, so uh, for many, for all of its, for most of its history, the diocese had only one uh, ordinary or one bishop, but it was about mm, four, five, or six years ago the Vatican named. Uh, uh, a second bishop to the Diocese of Brownsville. So he's called uh, an auxiliary bishop. He, he uh, was a priest here in the diocese and he was chosen by the Vatican to uh, be ordained a bishop and assist uh, Bishop uh, Daniel Flores. And that was in recognition of the, his, the history of this diocese. The fact that of all the dioceses, uh, in the whole United States, uh, this is per capita the most Catholic. It, but but with a shortage of priests. So, Father Sam, is there something about, you know, and maybe I've read this in passing or I've heard this in passing, that in the Mexican history and culture and tradition of the Mexican family, that many families always uh, identified one child, one boy to go into the priesthood. Well, yes, I think that that's not so much. But, uh, but is that something that uh, did it, happen at some yes, point in the story? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and then what happened? And, well, that's when families tended to be very large. So, uh, oh. and, and uh, families' parents knew that if one of their male children, male offspring, that he would receive a very good education in preparation for the priesthood. So that was one of the benefits. But of course, it came from a deep, deeply founded faith. Uh, that there was honor in becoming a priest, just as there was honor in marrying and having children. Uh, the, the Catholic faith being so deeply rooted in the history of, the, of, of, of our people uh, they felt it was an honor to to um, have one of their sons be chosen for the priesthood. Of course, they offered the son, but it wasn't like offering a sacrifice. It was out of a sense of devotion. And of course, the young man always had the choice. He could choose to become a priest uh, or not, but it was seen as an honor. With the advent of modern economies and and, and and the smaller family as well for maybe for economic mm -hmm. purposes or whatever cultural purposes. Now if you have one or two kids, the odds are much 
less. Yes, right. But when you had right. eight, nine, ten kids, you can probably guess that one of them may go into the priesthood. Sure. That or makes... or religious life. Uh, maybe a daughter would go into uh, into a religious community. I like to tell the people. <clears throat> sometimes I, I we pray for vocations all the time. So I kid with people, but in a way it's, it's, uh, it's joking, but serious joking. I say that uh, moms uh, love to offer their sons for the priesthood, love to pray for vocations, but they, they pray that the son chosen to be a priest will be her comadre's son, not her own. <laughs> Uh, because she wants grandchildren, right? right. And uh, so, so yeah, and they laugh about it. But there's, you know, there's truth to it. They, there are expectations of. I mean, you have expectations for your children, but, but, and they don't always agree with you. But, but uh, yeah, uh, the faith is deeply rooted in the history of our people, and so, so is the the um, the appreciation for what the priest represents, the holy sacrifice of the mass. Uh, and for uh, the practicing Catholic Christian, there is nothing holier uh, than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so if, if, if the priest is leading them in praying and offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, of course they, they, would, say, they would see that man leading us in prayer. Uh, this, this is a holy vocation that he has thank you for all of that father sam when you went off to to become educated you know in the ways of the church as a young man you spoke to some of that earlier uh, what were some of the first forays into seeing the virgen de guadalupe what are some of the earlier memories of how you began to make sense of this very compelling cultural and religious and spiritual icon? Well, it was very on, very early on in my life. I, I uh, the Mexican American Cultural Center, which was uh, located on the grounds of Assumption Seminary in San Antonio. That's where, uh, because it was on the same grounds as uh, as where I lived, that was my first uh, that was my first exposure to the significance and the symbolism of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, that's where I began to hear more about her. That's where I linked uh, the Blessed Mother, as we call her, uh, the Mother of Jesus, the Holy Mother of God. Uh, that's where I began to, that's where I first understood that this wasn't just um, an abstract devotion, but that, it, that she is, her apparition is a historical fact. And, and, and that, that there is, that this representation is, is a pictorial poem in itself. Uh, and that's where I began to make that connection. That so as, as a young man, mm -hmm. you, you were already making these kinds of connections. The, the history and context of this, Father Sam, is that is shortly after the colonization process of the Americas, mm -hmm. so we have Pizarro in South America, we have Cortes coming into, into the Valley of Mexico in 1519, yeah. Yeah. the conquest is in full motion by 1521 there's already like some power that's gained and so with it comes the whole idea of christianity and the catholic church mm -hmm. and so shortly after that then we have an indigenous man by the name of juan diego yes who comes upon and so we think that this is sometime in the early 1530s who comes upon La Virgen. Okay, yes. She comes upon him. Ah. So so that is that he's on his way. Uh, it's uh, Which, by it's, the way, is very much like Father Sam. When I asked you, when did you find the inspiration? And you said, mm -hmm. I didn't know the inspiration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is about agency. Like yes. It's not yes. agency so much of the He human did not being. go looking for her. Ah. She was waiting for him. Uh 
she, he was chosen, uh, she as a mediator of the will of God, right? Uh, she is an instrument of the will of God, and it is... Uh, still nighttime, as it were, before sunrise. He's on his way to what is now, to Tepeyac. He's on his way to, uh, uh, he's going through Tepeyac to attend Holy Mass. Uh, and, and, uh, and she, he begins to hear um, this beautifully harmonious music that is unlike anything he's ever heard. And so he's drawn to it, and and uh, it it's emanating from Tepeyac, from the hill, and he walks toward it. It's so it is so beautiful, uh, so unlike anything he's ever heard, uh, and he's drawn to it. And that is where she he comes upon her, but she's waiting for him, and and uh, and she piques his interest, his, his curiosity through the music. But that music announces that what is happening is of God. This is 500 years ago. But we have seen that in the last 500 plus years, there's been an apparition of the Virgin in different parts of the world. Yeah. Can you speak to some of that? I mean, like, what are the impacts of that? Fatima, Lourdes, Guadalupe. Well, she, God, through her, intervenes uh, at at various times in 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 human history, but we see a pattern. She appears to humble people, very poor people like Juan Diego, uh, who at that time of the conquest would have been seen as a cast off, a castaway. Uh, at Fatima, she appeared to children, illiterate children people of good faith. Uh, so so it, is, it is seen as uh, an intervention on the part of God, our Father, uh, through the, the Blessed Mother. So she represents compassion and, and, and mercy. She, she, she represents, as we see here, she represents uh, the the one through whom we live and have our being, so she she always comes as a messenger of God, she, and she tends to appear to people who are humble, who are poor, who have no airs about them. Their faith is deep. Their faith is sincere, and uh, she appeared at Fatima uh, during the time of the First World War. Uh, the, dep the depression would uh, be happening, would happen soon after, and then, of course, leading into the Second World War. So she always, she, she has appeared uh, uh, when, when people are suffering, uh, when there is there's worldwide suffering. So she, she, that's when, that's the pattern. In this particular case, Early to mid 16th century, Valley of Mexico, Tepeyac, as you say, she appears to Juan Diego. There was suffering happening at the time oh, yes. with the native people. I mean, they're going through a whole new way of life, a new custom, a new language, a new economy. New disease. A new disease. Smallpox. And so mm -hmm. she appears as, as an act of compassion. Is, yes, is an act yes, of mercy. Yes, yes, on the part of God, uh, she 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 speaks very gently and tenderly to Juan Diego, uh, and and he trusts her right away. That that is, uh, as she speaks directly to him, 
uh, she says that uh, my chosen one, my little one, my chosen one. Uh -huh. mm. So when you look at this image, Father Sam, mm -hmm. what, what are the elements here that are significant historically, culturally, socially, religiously? Well, we think the reason this image... Um, and by the way, what is this image and where is this image? This is in Mexico. This is a... This is... Uh, representation, uh, uh, we might even say a photocopy of the original image, which is encased and housed in the Basilica in Mexico City. Uh, when Juan Diego unrolled his uh, mantel, mantel uh, at that very moment that he, in which he was carrying uh, uh, the flowers, the bishop uh, the Blessed Mother, the Virgen, uh, had tasked Juan Diego with going to the bishop and telling him that she wished uh, a church to be built on Tepeyac, uh, which was known to be a hill where there was worship of uh, the the. Aztec gods. Uh, at the time of the appearance of the apparition, uh, the whole religious theological system of the Aztecs uh, had been destroyed by, uh, by the Spaniards. The Spanish missionaries uh, denounced uh, the gods, the whole uh, uh, spiritual way of worship of the Aztecs. So uh, the reason that uh, Aztecs uh, people uh, recognize this as a very important miracle, it is seen as a miracle. And so there's symbolism in it and they recognized it. So I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it on the screen as mm -hmm. you're describing mm -hmm. it. Uh, the, the, the idea of Juan Diego, like, hoisting, lifting, speak to that. Uh, Así, como que la tiene arriba. Yes, but this is an angel. That's an angel. Yes, this is not Juan Diego. Aha. Uh -huh. No, this is what? an angel. Uh, well, uh, it speaks that she is of heaven, mm -hmm. right? She comes as a messenger. She represents... She, behind her are the rays of the sun. They don't emanate from her. But uh, the Aztecs uh, had a sun god, the sun being the source of life uh, on earth. You know, we need the sun for the sustenance of life. So she comes as a representative. She is a powerful spokesperson for the god of life. The brown skin of the Virgin. Well, that's very significant. That, that identifies her as a lowly person. Although she is the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, as we call her, she identifies as one of, uh, she is, uh, she identifies with Juan Diego's people. She is not, uh, she she is, we might even say she is of mixed race. I didn't know this until recently, but if you look at the original copy in Mexico City, the image that was imprinted upon his mantel, um, based on different, if you, if, if you get close to it, she's very dark. She represents, uh, she's an Aztec. Uh, uh, maiden. But then at another distance, she also seems to be Spanish. She is a European. So she represents a, a mix of the two. She is a god means to do something new. And mm. so she represents the melding of the two cultures, the European 
and the indigenous of Mexico. Now, the original Mary was mm -hmm. not from Europe. She was from from uh, the Mediterranean of the Middle Holy yeah, Eastern Palestine. Palestine. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she is seen also. Her her complexion could be of someone from that part of the world. Why is it, Father Sam, that the Virgen has become a symbol for many causes? So, uh, uh, one example, for example, the the United Farm Worker cause. Mm. You know, the movimiento, right, for social justice and civil rights and that sort of thing. Say of of people in the Mexican American community, yeah. it was the ego and it was the Virgen. Oh, sure. Continues to be. Well, because, because her apparition was a historical intervention on the part of God, the source of all life, God, the creator, uh, God, who is love. But she represents uh, the feminine aspect of faith. So she represents compassion. So you see social justice, God himself representing justice. It's not that God is not compassionate, but she is a visible representation of compassion, tenderness. Uh, and, and, and we see it in her face. We see it in her gaze, uh, which, by the way, uh, at the moment that this appears on his mantel, she is looking down at... Juan Diego, the bishop, and other people who are, in, who are in the room where Juan Diego unfurls his mantel. So she is actually present at the moment that Juan Diego unfurls his mantel. And so the scientific studies have revealed that in her eyes, uh, the scientists have seen up to 13 people that she is looking at, at that very moment that he unfurls his mantel. So the black cinturón, mm -hmm. estar en cinta in Spanish, it means to be pregnant, to be expecting. So she is pregnant. She represents, she's carrying the savior of the world. So, so she, yeah, she is a great symbol of redemption. She's carrying redemption within her. Jesus Christ. So she is, she is in that respect. This is why she is so important to so many social justice causes, social justice causes, uh, because, well, we all know how much we need our mother's love, her ten their tenderness, their, their guidance, even their strictness. But she, she appeared to a people who, according to all Spanish standards, were inferior. So just the sheer fact that she looks like the Aztecs, the indigenous of Mexico, she already identifies with those who have been cast off. So she represents God's intervention, but she is a symbol of social justice herself because God has intervened on behalf of those who have been cast off who have been conquered, who are misunderstood, who feel helpless. Yesterday we had a program at the museum, Fiesta Noche Buena, and there was a moment right before the mariachi went on where I, I told the audience, so there were at least 60 people sitting in the audience and there were others who were standing and then the mariachi behind me. I think it was about that moment when I announced to everybody that we would be having a show the next day, a program mm -hmm. on La... I didn't say. I didn't say on what. I asked them, what do you think it will be on? Do you know what tomorrow is? So I asked that on the 11th mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of December. And a bunch of people raised their hands. People know that today is El Dia de la Virgen de Guadalupe. Yes. Speak to the popularity of the the kind of like presence in the lives of people of la virgen de guadalupe i'm talking about people here in south it, texas okay. why well she's popular because 
People need her to be present. The fact that God intervened, the fact that she appeared at a time at the lowest time uh, of in, in the history of the Mexican people, uh, a very violent time, uh, and and she the symbol itself is not just a symbol; it is a living presence. For the Mexican people, she is a living presence. And this image for the people of faith. By the way, she's the patroness of all the Americas. North America, Central America, South America, from Canada on down. She's the patroness of the Americas. I have seen her image uh, in convents in Europe, uh, Norway, Sweden. Uh, she is, she is, this symbol especially, she is known as the mother of God. The fact that she's carrying a child. We get to see her at a time, we read it in the Gospels, but in this image, we get to see her as she was at the moment. Oh, by the way, uh... A gynecologist did some studies and she, he believes that this represents she is with child, but she is almost at full gestation. So she is about to give birth. So the fact that she's about to give birth, not just to the redeemer of the world, Jesus, but to a new people. And the new people will be the mixed race. The mixed race. And so God is reaching into the sin that is present at that time, the, the, the conquering of people, mm -hmm. the destroying their, their buildings, their culture. God reaches into that through her mm -hmm. and performs a miracle. Mm -hmm. Not just this miracle, because this is a miracle, but the miracle of the melding of peoples. Uh, I'm just going to make the assumption that you've been to the Basilica. I haven't. You have Actually, not? No, no, I haven't. Wow. Yeah, yeah. How about that? It, so, it has, a, uh, things have happened at the Basilica that just reinforce mm -hmm. the miraculous power of the image. How would you suspect you would react, you would respond, you would you know yeah well Behave. i don't i when, first when of you, all yeah yes. i i would go with with curiosity and and a deep deep reverence and devotion that those words uh for for the faithful are very important they reverence her we don't adore her but we reverence her as any child would reverence his or her mother love her so I would be curious uh, to, uh, to see what I'm seeing here. Uh, I'm told, and I've read this, that the green, the blue-green of her, of her cloak here, her, uh, it changes according to uh, which angle you're looking at her. Uh, I just came ac across this recently. A Japanese ophthalmologist was doing a scientific analysis of her eyes and he fainted because, he said, her eyes were living. She was looking at him. And scientists have said that if a light is shined into her eyes, it, uh, just like light shines into our eyes, it, it, it reacts. So... And the temperature of the image itself, the uh, el mantel, is 98.6 degrees all the time. It's our, it's, it's, a, it's a living, it's a living presence. Hmm. So it has a kind of a Da Vinci quality of, say, the Mona Lisa. The, the oh, no, 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 not at looking. all. No, 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 no. It's not that type. No, mm. no, no, no. Uh, it is, uh, scientists have looked with x-rays and all mm -hmm. of that technology, 
uh, artists, even the Mona Lisa, he practiced, he drew it, and then he painted over it several times. This has no, no drawing underneath. It simply was, hmm. was produced. It simply was made at that moment that he unfurled his, his mantel. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is, uh, his sh uh she's standing on mm. the moon, the moon God, but she is more powerful than the moon God. She is a messenger of the sun God. So the Aztecs recognized that she came from God. She represents God. She, they know that because the, the rays are not emanating from her. But the fact that she stands in front of the rays means she's his messenger. She represents him. And whoever she represents is the supreme source of power and life. Mm. The sun being so important to the Aztecs, they even sacrificed to the sun god. The fact that she that the sun's rays are are behind her, she she it's not that she's blocking out the sun, but she comes from the sun. This is why they rec they they had uh, a rapport with it. They identified with it deeply. Have you um, given a sermon that's about this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? I focused on the fact that she's. And Sinta. Mm. I focused on that. Uh, and that's where that comes from. Estar en Sinta uh, is in, in those days, uh, uh, women of society, or uh, to represent uh, that they were pregnant, they would tie a little cinturon, a ribbon around their waist. And mm. this is why that they, they know that she is with child. Uh, there's a little right in here. There's a little cross under her clasp. Hmm. When, when was the last time you gave a sermon on this? It's been a few years now. And yeah. then just now. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's saying that uh, it's interesting, you know, how that someone broke down the gestation. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Sonia Hernandez is saying that it's interesting that someone broke down the gestation. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and furthermore, you see the stars? Mm -hmm. Astrologers have worked out that at that very moment in 1531, that these, these stars are the constellations that would have been right over Mexico City at that very, that very night. This is the, this represents the constellations that are overhead at that very night that this happened or the very day but these 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 are represent the stars so she is a messenger of the god of the universe well So, so you thought this was Juan Diego? Yeah, I mean, I just thought wait, is that Juan Diego? Yeah. No, well, he is, is a he is. You know, he's a he's looks like a like an indigenous angel, doesn't he? And why shouldn't he, right? And and it, she also looks that the olive olive uh, tone to her skin. Uh, Jewish scholars think that she's also dressed as a Jewish maiden of the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's there's that also. She's dressed. Uh, the Aztecs, the indigenous, rep know that she is of royalty, and of course she is because the mother of Jesus. Well, just listening to you here, Father Sam, to me, if I can glean one lesson, I glean a lot of lessons from this, but one lesson is that it seems that the world has something to say about her because you've referenced scandinavian people you've referenced jewish people you've referenced the americas as a patroness yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. so it's almost like the whole world wants a part of her 
Yes, I can see that. All of us at one time or another need to hear our mother say that she loves us. We need her nearness. Uh, the world is a very fast paced world. Um, people become more and more aggressive. More and more violence is the default mode of people and countries. But, but she represents the stillness and silence of God himself. Uh, I think the reason people identify with her image is that even though we say, oh, it's miraculous, and it is, but it is, it, you know, there's, this was at the time social media and still is. Is even more powerful than social media because faith, we're humans. We need physical representations. We uh, uh, just like we need to work, uh, uh, talk to each other and eat with one another and convivir. Uh, for people of faith, uh, those who who see this, not every person will look at it and say, "Ah," but those who do, you know. Uh, there's a stillness and a silence to the image. Uh, she's not screaming. She's not shouting any, but the Lord is saying something. The Lord God is saying something. That's, that's why it touches people on such a deep level. So I think part of what you've done here, Father Sam, is you have also helped us to frame um, how this particular program, which is on social media, how we can have a stillness about us, even as we are on what is a very frenetic and fast-paced mode of communication mm -hmm. that is social media. And so by injecting the virtue broadly of La Virgen de Guadalupe, that we could even use social media to maybe you know, talk about peace, mm -hmm. talk about justice, talk about silence and stillness and just respecting each other. That's what I also glean from this platica, that the Virgencita brings us all of those qualities to kind of hover over us. And if we want them, we can have them. Sure, sure. Yeah. You seem to have those. <laughs> Thank you. There is a saying among some Catholics these days, to Jesus through Mary, to Jesus through Mary. And that's what this represents, that the, um, within, I don't know how many decades, uh, um, millions upon millions of Aztec indigenous people of Mexico had converted to Christian, Christianity, uh, had been brought to the savior of the world through her. And, there, and there's, and it wasn't done through force. It wasn't done through conquering, but in a way she has conquered people's hearts. You know, she, it's, it's, we all recognize good hearted, kind hearted people. The, the, the authentic, good hearted, kind hearted people don't need to go around screaming, shouting, it's just their kindness, the good-heartedness that always speaks for itself. And that's that's what people, That's I think this is why people connect with the image. So one person here is saying, phenomenal. I'm not an artist, but I can clear, clearly see how her image emanates various celestial characterizations. The sun, the moon, the constellations. Powerful. Mm-hmm. Good. So, Father Sam, you've uh, ignited a little bit of yeah. imagination here this morning. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I have uh, really enjoyed listening to you do this 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 kind of deep analysis of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Thank you. Appreciate thank that. Thank you very much. And thanks to the two texts that yes. made this possible, right? So, so Pamela is behind this this all of this stuff here. So she's working the computer system and actually mm -hmm. also mixing oh. from camera to camera uh -huh. 
and Tony is behind the camera. So this is Tony Benya, and this is and so. Thank you Pamela. to Pam, and thank you to Tony. Yeah. God bless both of you. So I'm going to exercise privilege here as the interviewer and ask Pam if maybe she has an observation or a question because she's okay. very devout, and mm -hmm. Pam is is the one whose mother actually went into Mexico. So Pam's mother just in the last couple of weeks went to Aguascalientes, where she's from. Wow. Uh -huh. to, I, to bring this. Yeah, yes. Because uh -huh. you had in a previous yeah. call you had said, I need that image. Because yeah, I want to talk yeah. about that image. And so Pam's mother, Silvia Morales, brought this. So a shout out to Silvia. But I wonder, Tony and Pam, do you have any observation or maybe a question? Because we're gonna have Father Sam on for just a couple more minutes and then El se va. I guess the only thing would be um, that on this day in Mexico, people get on their knees and they, I guess, walk. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, as so a sign of just, devotion. Just so people can hear, because I'm not sure if okay. the audience would have got this, but, you know, Pam, I think, is referencing, you know, the sign of devotion, which mm -hmm. is to essentially crawl all the way up to... On their knees. On their knees. Mm -hmm. On their knees as, as part of probably promesas that people have made or maybe just to honor La Virgen. And also to repent if, if they, 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 it's a sign of love and devotion, also a sign of humility saying, I, I get on my knees to pray. I get on my knees uh, uh, and, and come into your presence. Uh, it, it's done in Fatima, by the way, also. I, I saw it there when I visited Fatima. Uh, um, and and it's, um, you know, for all of us, it's a sign of if to get people get on their knees to propose uh, because it's such an important time and event. But to get on their knees and walk hundreds of yards into uh, the Basilica it, it is a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice that people are willing to make. Uh, it's also, I think, a sign of obedience in a way. Not that she's asking this of people, but, but that they love her so much and want to have her present in their life. This is a very, this is a very physical uh, um, manifestation of their devotion, of their need to repent, you know, because through her to Jesus. So it's also their demonstration of their love for the Christ. If they love, how can you love uh, uh, the Christ and not love his mother or vice versa, right? We're going to end on that note. Father okay. Uh, and, and I want to, you know, express uh, appreciation on behalf of the museum. Uh, but also on behalf of the public, because, you know, we're getting some chatter here, you know, where people are thanking you. You know, thanking the team for for this production. So it's good to see you again. And good to see you. Yes, and yeah. uh, this has been a delightful platica, and and maybe we can do it again. Yes, of course. Thank you, Father. Yeah. God bless. So we sign off uh, for this edition of the December 2022 Museum Platica, Museum Platicas, and so we will see you again, friends of the museum, in January of 2023. So thank you for joining us. And happy holidays to everyone.